Okay, um, my name is Elena Rukunova. I am associate professor of uh, School of Psychology, and uh, the meeting we have today is called Cognitive Seminar, if you didn't know. Um, and our seminars will uh, take part once a month, usually. Uh, they will take part uh, in Tuesday, 6 o'clock. Um, there will be seminars with lectures and discussions, uh, and they will be in Russian and in English. So um, you can find more information on our seminar webpage. Uh, you can find information also on social networks, and uh, if you want, you can watch the videos from the seminar on YouTube. And as well as our seminar announces in uh, our famous public with pictures. <laughs> uh, so I'm uh, glad to announce you the first speaker of this season, who is Matel Figura, the assistant professor of uh, School of Psychology in High School of Economics, and he will introduce you some talking about neuromodulation. Matel, how would you like to make lecture? You may you can also speak for that one. Can you check those words? Okay, good. So I will make a brief introduction about the invasive brain stimulation, main stimulation techniques. Then uh, <clears throat> I will focus a bit on the new enhancement effect. Okay? Maybe some of you already saw some of my seminar on this topic, some of you maybe not, but I guess can be interesting. How to use brain stimulation in order to boost uh, behavioral performance or brain activity. Okay? So, first, in terms of boosting, what is near enhancement? Okay? So, when we talk about near enhancement, we talk about possibility to induce increase in brain activity, okay? But this increase needs to be focused. So I mean like stimulating the brain or increasing brain activity does not necessarily mean we are inducing some enhancement effect or we are boosting some performance, okay? So usually, you know that for specific processes like attention, perception, no, there are specific uh, subserving networks related. And, and then also some, let's say, functional um, behavior outcome that they might be related to this, you know, to the, related to this process, let's say, attentional processing. It might also subserve two different networks, okay? For example, one, we're talking to the selective attention, distributed attention, and then sometimes the subject, or also in our everyday life, we need to shift from one network to another network. So there are some trans, trans, transition between networks. And for example, an enhancement can also represent the ability to facilitate uh, this transition within and between networks. Okay, networks, brain networks are mainly related to networking different brain region. Okay, this should serve a specific process, motor control, imagination, and so on. So, Cognitive enhancement and near enhancement describe the increase in cognitive performance hmm, in humans. And how can we induce this enhancement effect? So we can induce this enhancement effect by using brain stimulation. As well, we can induce this enhancement effect by using psychotropic drugs, for example, to boost. Uh, as well, there are also other kind of techniques. Okay, for example, like daily training or so on. You know, there are also this school that helps you to improve your memory, no? By, uh, by making different associations and making different tasks daily. This increases like your memory performance, or at least your shorter memory performance. Well, you know, there is this, uh, <coughs> this, 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 kind of fairy tale, no? And people say, are we using uh, 
ten percent of our brain? No. No. Okay. So it's just uh, not true. So we are using hundred percent of our brain every day when you sleep, when you wake up. Okay. So our brain is always active. It's in active. Okay. Cells are firing. Information is transmitted, and brain is always active. The point is, what when we said it is I mean like when we used to say you're using 10 percent of your brain, the point is how to optimize our brain to perform at the best. Okay. No, brain is always active. It works, it's right, it does work, it doesn't matter. But, okay, let's so hope some movie clips will work. So as I said, we can stimulate our brain by using some technique in your physiology, like brain stimulation, or some in pharmacology, you can use some psych psychotropic drugs. But we will talk about non-invasive brain stimulation today. So, uh, for brain stimulation, we have some invasive and non-invasive technique. Okay? So, for example, invasive is deep brain stimulation, DBS. And usually, this, te this technique is uh, widely, I think it's pretty novel technique somehow, but I would say that it's widely used uh, in Parkinson's disease for those patients who are eligible to go to neurosurgery and to allow to implant an electrode in the thalamus. And then you see here, peripherally, there is a kind of uh, pacemaker-like device. It is the remote control for electrical stimulation in the thalamus. And let's say that the medical doctor or the neurologist can, after the surgery, can modulate the frequency of stimulation, okay, by placing a uh, the device attached here to, the, to his device via Bluetooth, by wireless, now technology is advanced. So, and you can regulate, you see, so electrodes go deep in the thalamus and then you have this, your remote control here, and you can regulate the frequency of stimulation. For example, in Parkinson's disease, this kind of technique reduces drastically the motor tremor, for example, in Parkinson's. It's very useful. So it's not a cure, okay? Because Parkinson's is a degenerative disease, but <clears throat> it really improves the quality of life of the patient, which you know, is able not, you know, to walk properly and to coordinate his or her movement. And then there is non-invasive brain stimulation, which is the one that is mostly used uh, in basic research in neuroscience, in cognitive psychology, in medical environment, like in neurology, and so on. So, most used technique is transcranial magnetic stimulation and transcranial electrical stimulation. Okay, these are non-invasive technique. So we just place some electrode or some device on the skull, and then we induce some electrical fields which are able to modulate neuronal activity. Okay. Okay. So, why non-invasive brain stimulation are important technique? We can induce brain plasticity change, okay? Or better to say, we cannot induce long-term effect. Like, it's very difficult to induce long-term plasticity effect. So, effects of brain stimulation is really transitory. For example, if you use EMS during, uh, inside one day on a patient, you can induce a modulation of neuronal activity for a certain amount of time half an hour, one hour maximum. They are, after a while, the neural state of the patients comes to the baseline. Or also the healthy humans, if you're running an experiment on healthy humans. Okay? So, but you might use likely short-term plasticity. And actually, you might also like, uh, you can also induce long-term plasticity, but this can be, n now it's just recent study show that it's promising if you make daily brain stimulation. Okay, so daily brain stimulation on patient, and especially if associated with training together, it can induce long-term plasticity effect. Okay, so <clears throat> is that clear so far? Good. Okay, so how does it work, for example, TMS? 
transcranial magnetic stimulation. Imagine like a, a huge uh, generator, big generator of electrical current, high voltage current, okay, which go through, uh, I'll show you here, yeah, this is who invented the first brain stimulation. It's a, a British engineer, Barker. So this electrical current is generated here, high voltage, and for a Faraday principle, you, big electrical amount of current generate a magnetic field, okay? So the currents go through a coil, and the coil generate a magnetic field. Magnetic field is, you know, it's not like electroconvulsive shock. There's nothing to be afraid of. Magnetic fields um, can pass through the bone, non-invasively. You don't feel it, okay? Because it's magnetic, it's not electric, usual electric currents. It doesn't encounter a resistance that usually electrical current encounter when you through the bone of the scalp. And it can pass through the scalp, non-invasively, and just a single pulse of magnetic stimulation it can induce like a local depolarization, okay? Meaning that induce neurons, okay, under the, under the coil, in a resolution of one centimeter square, roughly, just a single pulse stimulation, to discharge, okay? So, you give a pulse, and neurons fire it. So you produce action potential. The neuron produce action potential. It's proper neurostimulation technique. Okay? Um, it can be measured by EEG, can be measured by electromyography if you stimulate the primary motor cortex, and so on. And can you measure also behavior up? You see, there are different coil shape, but as you can see, the maximum. Uh, you have a stick. The maximum uh, focus of a figure eight coil, which is this classical coil, is in the center, okay? As you can see here from this model, by placing the coil on a specific brain region, you can see in the green, the green part of the brain is the one that it goes under stimulation, okay? Producing in the center. Okay, this is some fMRI evidence. We can also combine this thing together with the MRI. But you need to build up like specific coil, they do, plastic covered, because in fMRI you cannot put a DMS coil inside the scan. And you can also see the effect online of DMS during a functional magnetic arrest. So you see why why it can be important also from producing research and for studying brain activity, TMS is just that you see there is this coil, you go on the scalp of the subject, then you can use a neural navigation system in order to be precise. How does it work? Um, you send your subject or you have your structural scan. So you go to magnetic resonance, you have an image of your brain, okay? Then you put this image on your brain in a neural navigation system. Then thanks to some sensor, you see these are put on the glasses of the subject, sensor on the coil, you can calibrate your actual uh, uh, model of your head in real time together with your structural scan. This is a classical ne neural navigation system that also neurosurgeons use, okay? When they need to go inside some brain structure, and you cannot see with your real eyes, but you can see by neural navigation exactly which point of the brain you are touching, okay? This can be also useful if you use brain stimulation in order to understand which part of the brain, exactly which part of the cortex, sulcus, gyrus, you're going to stimulate. Now, why is it's cool to use brain stimulation? It's just that, you know, as I said, it's non-invasive, it's not painful, and you can stimulate some brain area which are involved, uh, for example, for specific process, let's say attention, memory, and so on. Hmm? Now, let's hypothesize this guy. He's making, uh, let's say, a computer task. Huh? And we are measuring memory performance, attention performance. And while the subject is, while the subject is making the task, is performing the task, you can online stimulate in an area 
which you suppose to be involved in that task. Okay? And you can measure online performance. Hmm? How does it work? So, I mean, like, it's very basic. You, you call your subject and you are performing a task. Okay? Attention task. Then, then now what you do? You measure your behavioral performance. Accuracy, so how much good you are hmm, in this attention task. And reaction time, okay? How much you are good in terms of speed of response. Okay? These behavioral indexes measure so indirectly your brain functions. Now, you want to understand which area is involved in this attentional task. For fMRI, you know functional magnetic resonance, right? Give you very high spatial resolution. So you put subject inside the scan, and you can see which which part of the brain is involved in attention. Okay, but you don't know exactly when. Electroencephalography instead has a very high temporal resolution. So in terms of milliseconds, you can measure electrical activity related, for example, to attention. In TMS. It's important, as well as also TBCS, another electrical stimulation uh, technique I'm going to show you now, because it merged together pretty high spatial resolution, at least on the cortex, so meaning that you have one centimeter square that you can stimulate the brain, so you're pretty much precise, and also very high temporal resolution. You can decide how many pulses to deliver in and in which frequency to deliver. Okay? So for example, you want to stimulate in your screen, it appears, okay, during the attention tax, it appears a stimulus which lasts 500 milliseconds. And you know from fMRI the parietal cortex is involved in processing the, uh, this kind of stimulus during the attention. And you want to causally address the relationship between the parietal cortex and the behavioral outcome during the attention. What do you do? You give a train, interference train, like 10 hertz or 20 hertz during 500 milliseconds, like a train of pulse, you know, or single pulse. And you try to induce this called perturbation approach, an interference during processing of the information. So you, you kind of induce, it's called the virtual lesion effect. Okay, kind of virtual lesion on the area involved in this attentional process. And you see that respect to when you perform the task without TMS, or respect to when you perform the task during TMS of a region involved in attention, that when you perform the task and you receive these pulses, your performance change. Okay? If your performance change, it means that you stimulate the right region. Okay? And that, that region is really functional for your performance. Okay? Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Then, how can you say that, for example, you stimulate that specific brain region and you find an effect respect when you don't, you don't have TMS on your head? Mm -hmm. Maybe just, you know, the fact that I have the coil here makes me change the performance. What do you do? You check with some control arrows. For example, you know from fMRI, the right one is involved. Okay. And then you can, you can test attention. I just give an example of attention, but it can be also perception, memory. Then you uh, work in memory task, for example. Then what you do? You change, uh, you decide to stimulate another brain region, which you see that it's probably not involved in attention. Let's say motor cortex, control arrow. Okay? So you stimulate motor cortex, and you're still good in your attentional task. You don't stimulate at all, and the performance of motor cortex stimulation and no stimulation is similar. Then you stimulate the right cortex, and you see that there is this change in performance. Then you prove, really, empirical evidence that, more, that right cortex is involved in that kind of task. Okay? That's why it can be useful for basic research. Okay, for example, why DMS can be useful is also to map, for example, in the sensory motor cortex, is very, very used. 
Okay, because you can measure the cortical spinal output by motor evoked potential with the controller at hand. What does it mean? For example, if I give a pulse on the primary motor cortex on the dominant hemisphere, so if I'm right-handed, my dominant hemisphere is the left. Okay? My motor dominant motor cortex is the left one. If I give a single pulse on my motor cortex, it's likely you observe, you observe a twitch, muscular twitch on the contralateral hand. Okay? You know there is this kind of homunculus of the motor cortex. So the hand is cortically represented, as well as the mouth, okay? as well as the leg. But the leg you know, is a little bit more deeper and more central. For example, to have a leg twitch on the hand muscle leg twitch, we need to stimulate very high intensity. Because stimulation doesn't go so deep. This is the limitation of this technique. Some subcortical structure you cannot reach by TMS. The last representation you can still do it. There are some special core that allows you to do it. Okay? I want to show you this example. For example, one <coughs> TMS is very used to measure uh, in the motor control study because you can really have a physiological measurement by recording muscular activity from the hand, from the leg, depending on what you want to study. Okay? Instead, if you use TMS to just visual attention, you cannot have this physiological evidence. Actually, now you can recently because you can also do EEG and TMS together. So you can check with electroencephalography what's happening in your brain activity by using, for example, EEG TMS combined. But this is the motor cortex is very good as a representative of how does it work TMS because you can really observe, like um, you can visually observe this motor twitch, which means that, like you are really stimulating the brain and you're pretty much selective. If you move out from the motor cortex, this twitch go away, disappear. So here, if it will work, I want to show you. No, it doesn't. What is issue? Okay. But I want to show you, <coughs> let me check. Okay, for example, you can see that in our lab we use the navigation system. Can you see when you give a single pulse of TMS, can you see this twitch on the hand? And then you can measure motor water potential. I'll show you again. We are on the motor cortex, we use navigation system, you see? And then look at the hand. Single pulse induce this twitch. You measure muscle activity and you induce this motor water potential. Let's check it. So here you should see this. You see this twitch of the hand. Right? Okay? So if you just move a bit out of the motor cortex, you won't see this twitch and you won't record this activity. Okay? Now, uh, how, you know, there are lots of protocols you, that you can apply with EMS. There are, so what I show you now is just a single pulse of TMS. As I said, one single pulse of TMS induces a local depolarization, focus is around one centimeter square, and this effect is really transient, okay? So you destabilize, like, uh, let's call it like the uh, sensor motor cortex, like the system, okay, which is bad at rest, or during a task. You induce this perturbation. You give just one pulse, you induce this local depolarization. But if you, which lasts just a bunch of milliseconds, say 60 to 100 milliseconds, you give a pulse, you have 100 milliseconds of this depolarization effect, then the, the neural arm pulls that you recruited, it, it comes back to the baseline. Okay? But if you give TMS, and if you give, if you deliver TMS uh, with different frequencies, okay, like a series of pulses, with specific 
ryth rhythmic EMS, okay? Like one pulse per second, let's say one hertz. So actually, you can divide different kind of protocol with EMS. You can use conventional repetitive EMS, conventional R EMS, so rhythmic EMS or repetitive EMS, or pattern then repetitive EMS. These are more advanced protocols. But for example, if you see here, if you give one pulse per second, one hertz repetitive TMS like like this in specific brain region for around 10 minutes hmm? at an intensity which corresponds with your motor threshold meaning the minimum intensity to elicit this motor evoked potential for 10 minutes repetitive TMS can induce inhibition of the brain area okay which lasts usually from 30 minutes at least maximum one hour okay depending for how long depending by the intensity plus there are some inter-individual uh, inter differences but at least 10 and 1 hertz repetitive TMS for around 10 minutes suppress cortical excitability cortical activity in a certain say amount okay so you have this kind of inhibitory effect it's been used a lot for studying brain activity, for studying memory, perception, uh, involvement, for example, of area B5 in movement perception. Okay? There are some studies that show if you give one hertz TMS on this area for 10 minutes, okay, you decrease the performance of the subject. Okay? Then there are some excitatory protocol. For example, 10 hertz and 20 hertz depending, you see how I deliver it. For example, 20 hertz in burst of 2 seconds, then you have a stop, 2 seconds, can induce excitation, okay? Excitatory effect. So you increase activity of the local brain region. This can have consequences in terms of behavior, okay? It can induce this, let's say, increase, enhancement effect. Okay, is that clear? Yeah. How is it possible to hold the coil for 10 minutes in the, the same position? <laughs> and it's, uh, it's a sport. <laughs> <laughs> so you can use the different ways. You can also you can use this uh, score like um, this arm, uh, mechanical arm. Mm -hmm. You fix the coil. I guess mm -hmm. it should somewhere. Let me check. Okay. Yeah. Ah, maybe here. Yeah. You see, no one is. Yeah. The coil is hold by this kind of arm. That different kind of arm. Okay, and you think that means there. But in my experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, in my experience, uh, in my experience, it's difficult to to do it with this mechanical art because if the subject just move a bit the head, mm -hmm. you just so the TMS so the magnetic field is very sensible to orientation angle. You know, you just change a bit the angle of few millimeters or rotate you rotate the coil of few millimeters you can even recruit another neuronal pool, not exactly the same neurons. Mm -hmm. So, and sometimes there are intravisional differences and in intravisional networking, okay? So, that, that's why. And what I, my school teach me <laughs> is staying on with the coil with your hand. You have an online neural navigation system, you can monitor your position mm -hmm. and it can tell you how much you are going out, how much you are staying on the point. So you see online. While you're online, you do this. Or you can use mechanical arm together with your arm to help you because coil can be a bit heavy in order that you still have a bit of degree of freedom to adjust the coil. Because some, if the subject moves like this, mm -hmm. there's no way to adjust the coil because it's fixed with the arm. Mm -hmm. So use the point. Okay? Or there is something very cool that costs them lots of money. 
is the robot of robotic arm. Mm -hmm. a, a robotic arm works great. Okay, so you record your point, subject moves, arms moves and come back to the point. So it adjusts continuously. Mm -hmm. Okay? The, there are different components that's a little bit. Okay. So did you did you get how works magnetic stimulation? Hmm? More or less? Yeah. Hmm? Good. So now we'll talk about electrical stimulation. Okay? So electrical stimulation is uh, is not proper neurostimulation. Okay? It's more neuromodulation technique. What does it mean? Is that with EMS, if you give a pulse, you induce neurons to discharge, to fire. Okay? Neurons produce, produce action potential. Then if you give different protocol at different frequency, you can induce this cumulative effect. And you can also modulate the endogenous oscillatory activities. We can also induce this entrainment effect in the endogenous oscillatory activity. But transcranial electrical stimulation instead is a pure neuromodulatory technique, meaning that you stimulate, you don't induce neurons to fire. Okay? You just modulate the resting membrane potential. What does it mean? It means that I will show you this later. Okay? <laughs> Sorry. I will, um, maybe it was better. I'm speaking not following my slide. Um, so Actually, it's called polarizing effect, okay? So, neurons don't fire, but you change neuronal resting membrane potential. What does it mean? I will explain you in a moment, okay? Now, uh, how can you then, so electrical stimulation with respect to TMS is very light stimulation. That's why you don't stimulate neurons. To, stim to make neurons to fire, you need a very huge uh, you need very high voltage electrical uh, car, which will make your subject not to be so happy. Okay? Because the field is no magnetic, it's electrical. So you have the resistance of the scalp and it, it will become like electroconvulsive shock, which, which is no good. It seems to be, you know, despite the fact it's less powerful than TMS, the effects are really great. Because uh, TDC electrical stimulation can induce LTP-like phenomena. This, let's say, long-term potentiation phenomena, which are related with this long-term and short-term plasticity I was talking about initially. Okay? So you can induce enhancement of a brain area or inhibition of a, a brain area or a brain network. There are three main, uh, you know, it's electrical stimulation. You have two electrodes. Okay? Which kind of current you can deliver? You can deliver direct current stimulation, okay? It's called TDCS, meaning that you can use, uh, you can give uh, anodal or cathodal stimulation. So it's polarity dependent. You can use, you can do just, you can use just your anode to try to increase cortical excitability, or cathode to decrease cortical excitability. Then there is a random noise stimulation, which is stochastic stimulation at different frequency. Okay, it's just neuronal, I mean like, it's just electrical noise, which is supposed to interact, depending if it's high frequency noise or low frequency noise, with your cortical excitability. Okay, you can increase, or usually you increase, okay, cortical excitability by using random noise. And usually high frequency random noise work perfectly, like, for example, frequency of stimulation ranging between 300 Hz and 600 Hz looks like they affect your brain activity in terms of boosting, okay, increase, and also boost behavioral performance. And then there is alternating current stimulation, which is simply sinusoidal oscillatory potential delivered at different frequency. The idea of DACS, which is one of my favorite techniques, is to have the possibility to interact with the free, your endogenous oscillatory frequency. Okay? For example, if a brain area or brain network, you know, two areas, they chat to each other at a specific frequency. 
Okay? They can chat in beta, in theta, for example, operator frontal theta activity related to working memory. Okay? And looks like if you, for example, in a working memory task, you deliver alternating current stimulation okay, at specific frequency, like in theta frequency, you can use this enfranchement effect. Meaning you anchor, you drag your endogenous oscillatory activity which oscillates in theta to the one that you are delivering. So you boost, you increase the power of that activity. The effect is frequency dependent. For example, in simple frontal cortex, you give theta stimulation and your right frontal network oscillates in theta stimulating theta frequency, you find this increase of working memory. If you give another frequency, like gamma, while your, your network is oscillating in theta, you don't induce anything, okay? any effect. It's very interesting because you can induce this frequency-specific effect. You have kind of frequency resolution. So, another point of using uh, electrical stimulation, advantages and disadvantages, is that TMS, as I say, is more focused. But electrical stimulation is less focused. So electrodes are kind of three centimeters square. Three, actually, are small electrodes to 35 centimeters square on the scalp. So you don't have this focusing, let's say. But you have some other advantages. For example, in the, in the case, you, you don't necessarily, it depends by what is your hypothesis. In the, in the, for example, for the case of alternating current stimulation, what is important is you have this frequency resolution. Okay? You check which frequency is affected, okay? the specific target value. This is advantage and disadvantages. So this is, you see, respect to TMS, electrical stimulator is very small, it's portable. This is an advantage, respect to TMS. For example, if you want to test patients, you want to, to, to use electrical stimulation as a neuro rehabilitation tool, it's much more easy, it's much more portable. Okay? In patients, they can do all the treatment home. Okay? In training and rehabilitation home. Okay? So, for example, this is an example like how does it work electrical stimulation with respect to, to magnetic stimulation. So, as I said, in PMS, you induce this uh, neuronal discharge. Okay? So neuron are firing, you, use, you make neurons to make action potential is a neuro stimulation. In the case of direct power stimulation, PDCS, instead you modulate the resting membrane potential. Okay? So meaning that you modulate the likelihood of a neuron mm, to fire or not to fire. Okay? You change the threshold. Okay? And this goes hand by hand with the polarity that they are using during a direct current stimulation. If you use anodal stimulation, okay, you work at ODA, depending on what you use. In any, by using, a, uh, how do you modulate this treasure? Because you induce like a huge massive change of ion concentration, ions, at the level of the resting membrane potential. Meaning that, for example, if you, decree, if you increase the treasure, of the neurons to fire, meaning you are doing this kind of hyperpolarization effect, you can use cathode stimulation. So you use cathode stimulation, you induce hyperpolarization effect, and the neuron is likely not to fire. Okay? So meaning you induce this kind of inhibition. If you use another stimulation, you induce depolarization effect meaning that the neuron is more likely to fire because you decrease the treasure of the neuronal fire. Okay? Neurons is at rest, but at a certain point, neurons will fire eventually. For example, if I'm doing this action, okay, my neurons are, you know, there is, and are, are producing synapses, okay? and they are discharging. Okay? And there is a recruitment of neuron activity in order to make me to perform this movement. Okay? Now, to induce these neurons to discharge, my, uh, my brain area is supposed to be involved. The area I'm stimulating. If the area I'm stimulating is the one that allows me to do this, or is involved in this kind of process, and I'm using another stimulation, I'm making, I'm, I'm making actually, I'm increasing the probability that the neuron will fire more easily. Okay? 
So meaning I will use facilitatory effect, okay? If I'm using cathode stimulation, I'm using like inhibitory effect. Is that clear? Good. Uh, yeah. Now, this is an interesting study. I wanted to show you that. Um, for example, in this, we, we did this, we performed this study in order to understand what is the time course, okay, of the stimulation effect. Uh, in this case, we use direct current stimulation. How does, it, how does it work with DCS? You remember, I showed you direct current stimulation, alternating, random noise. How does it work with DCS? The DCS works offline, okay? So you give like, uh, you deliver like, uh, offline, like one hertz protocol offline DMS. You deliver 10 minutes of stimulation, and then when you switch off the stimulation, you have 30 minutes of after effect, okay? This after effect is intensity dependent and also time dependent. So if you give 15 minutes to DCS, it's likely you have longer after effect. If you give TDCS instead to at 1 milliamp, you give 1.5 milliamp, you likely have longer after effect. For example, in the study, we stimulated the motor cortex. We measured a lot of vital parameters, heart rate, diastolic, uh, uh, systolic pressure, everything. And subject were at rest, and we measured motor evoked potential. You remember this potential from the muscles I showed you in the movie clip, okay? And then we, 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 we wanted to understand how long is the after effect and if it's really offline effect or if during the stimulation something already starts to change. Okay? And what we did? We, we used transcranial direct current stimulation on the motor cortex and we used TMS, single parts, as a probe. It was our test. No? to stimulate the single parts of the motor cortex and check motor evoker potential. And check in variation of motor evoker potential depending by the TDCS condition. What does it mean? It means the subject sit down, okay? Then before TDCS, we measure vital parameters, okay? And then we measure also motor evoker potential, like our baseline, cortical excitability at rest by single pulse TMS, without electrical stimulation. Then, depending by the day, we randomize our condition. We use anodal cathodal TDCS on the motor cortex, and the sham is placebo stimulation, okay? And during TDCS, by placing the, electrode, the TMS over the electrode of the stimulation, this combining approach, we measure motor evoker potential online during stimulation for 15 minutes. Then we switch off the TDCS and classically we expect the effect of TDCS after the, the, uh, at the offset of the stimulation. And we check in tiny windows of 5 minutes for after effect of TDCS, 15 minutes after and 30 minutes after. Okay? Then we measure again the cortical excitability at rest to see if the after effect after the after effect the uh, cortical excitability come back to the baseline. So, it's a time course. Anyway, what we showed is that when you deliver TDCS, okay, for the first, when you, when you measure, the, when you measure cortical activity for the first 15 minutes, you don't have any effect of TDCS. There's no electrical stimulation, okay? Then after 15 minutes, this is a reflex. This data is exactly the time course of the design. Okay? Then from 15 minutes to 30 minutes is during online stimulation. Okay? Here we have just in one time window one significant effect of another. But mainly there is nothing. Okay? Nothing is happening. At the switching off of the TDCS, you start to see this you know, divergent effect. So anodal increase, excite, cathodal decrease. And this is a sham. Sham, you know, doesn't change with respect to the baseline. 
to the 100% enjoy your cortical excitability. This is our data normalized with respect to the shunt. You see, another increase, but another decrease. So this proves that TDCS mainly works on flying. So during TDCS, nothing happens so much. Okay? Why this is important? Because uh, TDCS is super widely used to induce like this excitatory effect, inhibitory effect. But other kind of electrical stimulation, like PACS, systems, it seems to work in different ways. It seems to work on light. So while I'm receiving the stimulation, I'm having the effect. When you switch off the stimulation, you don't have any effect anymore. For example, this is an interesting study. You have still time? Uh, I guess. For example, uh, yeah, this is an interesting study with alternating current stimulation, which was published on Nature by Lisa Marshall. And she, Lisa Marshall is a professor studying the sleep. She's a sleep expert. And she showed that, how was the task? So she, she recruited a group of subjects, okay? And she wanted to investigate declarative memory, okay, in this subject. And the daily subject comes and they need to learn a list of words, okay? Then they go to sleep in the hospital. They are monitoring, they monitor the EEG activity during sleep. And the day after, subjects are asked to recall the words. For example, do you remember the words uh, you learned yesterday? How many words do you remember? It's called recall processing, okay? They need to recall the words they learned the day before. So uh, what she did, she stimulated, the in a group of subjects, she stimulated the parietal cortex, and she delivered the low-frequency alternating color stimulation, okay, during a REM sleep. You know, it was triggered. Then no RAM, then during RAM, stimulation. No RAM, stimulation. Okay? And what she showed is that uh, in terms of those who received stimulation during sleep, actually, this is just results, but she also controlled the frequency of stimulation. So one was 0 0.75 hertz, like in delta frequency, and one was another frequency, frequency of control. Plus, she had a sham group, like placebo group. She showed that who received stimulation during the night improved, you can see, like drastically improved the memory performance. Okay? This is very good stuff. This is the first frequency dependent effect of TSS. You need to understand that now there is a huge trend of this neuro boost, uh, boosting performance, uh, boosting brain activity. Looks like everyone can become a superhero if you receive like brain stimulation in the head. That's not properly like this. Okay. So, but it was interesting, okay? Because usually the brain stimulation is all, is, is especially in the 80s and the 90s, has been used to map the cortex, like a functional mapping of the cortex. And usually it was used to inhibit or to induce interference in order that you can map the cortex, okay? By making, you know, by studying this drop, drop of performance during a period of Now instead there is this huge trend to use like increase of performance, okay? Why? It also makes sense somehow. One side, you can also think about like clinical application of these techniques. So you can induce like, uh, you can induce this kind of uh, increase of excitability, this phenomenon are LTP like related, so long term plasticity change, long term potentiation related. So if you can induce change in this plasticity change, it's likely that you can help to do rehabilitation. You, you can use it as a tool for rehabilitation. rehabilitation. For example, in stroke patient, okay? This is like an example, or in aphasia patient by stroke. So here, for example, we stimulate the somatosensory cortex with alternative current stimulation online, and we found that subjects were feeling tactile sensation on the contralateral hand. On the, you know, for example, when you sleep over your hand, you have this kind of paresthesia. Hmm? You feel this tingling on the hand. And what was interesting is that 
we had just subjective rating of our subject. This was one of the first studies with the TSCS. We didn't understand so well how it works. We were really that driven. And, but the funny thing is, the interesting thing is that when subjects had stimulation, especially in alpha and in high gamma, they were feeling this sensation in the hand. While in other frequency, no, not at all. So it was really frequency specific effect. And then uh, what is interesting is that we start to think about like, why we are inducing this effect. Is because high frequency usually induce excitation? Or is it because we are interacting with the uh, oscillatory activity? We, we came back to study the literature, we find out that, of course, like, for example, tactile phenomenon or somatosensory sensation in EG study and have been shown that the somatosensory cortex dominant region are in alpha and gamma. For example, if I receive the stimulation on the tip of the finger, it's likely it can record with EG gamma activity in the somatosensory cortex. So we started to think that maybe if we give gamma in the somatosensory cortex, we are kind of simulating this kind of tactile sensation on the tip. So we are interacting with the dominant oscillatory activity of the somatosensory cortex. Oh. And, and then so on on the visual cortex, this can also go fast. For example, this we show that, for example, uh, beta and beta stimulation during light induce uh, decrease the phosphine pressure at the cortical excitability of the, of the visual cortex. I don't want to talk about what is a phosphine, uh, phosphine induced TMS. But still, <clears throat> only when delivered in the visual cortex, V1, calcarin cortex. Now, they still, like beta and alpha frequency, are the dominant oscillatory activity of the primary visual cortex, depending in daylight or in the dark. Okay? So still, again, seems like we are interacting with the endogenous oscillatory activity. And then, <coughs> What is funny, I don't know if it will work the move, is that to understand that if we are interacting with the electrical activity of the brain, uh, am I going to do much in detail or it's too complicated? Um, I guess it's fine. Okay. Because, because we have mostly as a, a cognitive bachelor students and master students, so I guess it's, it's okay. fair enough. So, for example, what, what we show is that the idea is this, is that is TACS, is alternating current stimulation, really inducing, uh, really interacting, inducing this enfriment phenomenon in the endogenous oscillatory activity. So are we really interacting with the oscillatory activity of our cortex and, and boosting? If we catch the right frequency in that specific brain region which corresponds to the stimulation frequency you are giving, it seems like you are boosting somehow brain activity, brain performance. So we try to do a combined approach, like I show you in the TBCS experiment, and we show that our beta stimulation increased cortical excitability at rest in the motor cortex. Then what we said, maybe it's just because subject receive electrical current in beta, beta is a high frequency, but even gamma is a high frequency, we didn't find anything. But beta is also dominant algebraic rhythm of the motor cortex at rest. So, in order to understand if you are interacting uh, with something ongoing in the brain, how can you prove it? And we had this idea to make the same experiment, this is the second one, with subject were at rest, but then somehow, in some blocks, we asked the subject to perform a motor imagery task. So subject don't move, they are still at rest. In one condition, they don't do anything. They don't have to do anything. In another condition, they need to imagine this finger going towards this. Okay? So they need to activate the motor cortex. They activate the motor cortex to make this imagery task. Now, if you do this, you change your brain state. Okay? When you are at rest, or when you and you don't do anything. Or when you instead you do imagination task, or you do whatever task, you change your brain state. That specific region change their activity, its activity. Okay? So and you change your oscillatory activity. And we know that in the motor cortex, 
you can induce this invariant synchronization and desynchronization of the motor cortex depending by the motor task. So, our idea was, if at rest I have an effect in beta, because I interact with beta with endogenous shutter activity, if I change the brain state, the state of the primary motor cortex, making our subject perform a motor task, I should see something different. So this beta activity, this beta effect should disappear. Okay? And that was like that, exactly. So when subject, so black bar is motor imagery, white bar is rest. At rest, we increase during beta stimulation, like here. You increase. You see, it's the white bar. But when subject performs motor imagery task, in beta, we didn't have any effect. And actually, we have a bit of inhibition effect. But we have a strong effect in theta and in alpha which makes sense because our task was visual motor imagery involving working memory, subserve, which, which, is, uh, which uh, is related to, you know, is, is, um, is working memory processing is a process that is guided by theta activity, okay? Especially visual motor imagery task can be parietal motor activity. And alpha is the, <coughs> is the endogenous oscillatory activity of the motor cortex during action, motor action, okay? And it also represents the oscillatory activity related to transform perception into action. So when you really plan to do a movement, when you then after you really execute a movement. So it makes sense that during the imagination of the movement, your brain state acts like you are really performing a movement, even if you don't execute. So anyway, we found the state dependent on the now, uh, we replicated this effect during action observation. So we asked our subject to observe this action instead of imaging this action, just observation. It's called mirror neurons activity. And we found still some state dependent effect during action observation, increasing alpha by adding gamma. And during rest, increasing beta again. And this one. Oh. Mm -hmm. So, this is an interesting study that we ran in Siena. And this, you know, had a lot of attention because, you know, uh, so my colleague Emiliano ran the study, which he's an expert of fluid intelligence, in intelligence, uh, in, in the brain. Yeah, I mean, brain activity related to intelligence tasks, like uh, this fluid and crystallized intelligence. You know that, for example, what is called the fluid system is all this system related to the working memory and logical reasoning. And what is the crystallized system is the system related to our knowledge. No? Let's say our long-term memory store. Okay? So the idea was, if TSES works so good in terms of boosting, why not to try to boost something which is very difficult to increase, like a fluid intelligence, for example. And he, based on uh, neuroimaging evidence, he targeted the middle frontal gyrus, okay? We use a vertex as a reference for our simulation. And subject were asked to perform A mat a Raven matrices task, no, Ra Ra Raven matrices is a classical intelligence task. You know, there are two, one, two, three relationship matrices, meaning like a characteristic related to this object in the matrix, and then you need to fulfill the missing items based on what you have here. And logical reasoning matrix, matrices, logic matrices, okay? So, <coughs> this represents mainly one process related to the characteristic of the stimulus. This is involved more logical reason to solve it. They're pretty complicated. But still, free relationship can be complicated in terms of speed and reaction time as well as the logic reason in the logic analysis. Now, I'm not an expert of this kind of task I'm talking about, that's the idea. But what happened? What was interesting is that when we delivered 
uh, that's kind of committing car stimulation on our subject. What we found out is that subject didn't change their performance in terms of accuracy, but look, in terms of reaction times, think about it, to solve this matrices, we are not talking about one second of reaction time, we're talking about a few seconds of reaction time. Okay? The times of response reduced drastically when stimulation was delivered in gamma. It was very robust, very strong effect. Okay? So gamma boosts the performance. And what was interesting, the gamma boosts the performance only for logic matrices, not for three, two, one relational matrices. So really boost intelligence. Okay? Then uh, what is interesting is that why the fact was specific for this, like if you do principal component analysis, we, we, saw, we can see that the strategy also to solve the matrices is different from logic respect to first two three relationship. Okay? So it's really kind of the effect of the stimulation was really state dependent. Okay, it's dependent by the condition of the task. And task dependent. I'm sorry. Uh, what is on the y-axis in these graphs? Is it X-axis no, is normalized data in terms uh, of t-score uh, of this reaction time. So there were, there were kind of few cycle reaction times, so there was kind of normalization respect to baseline. It's just normalized data, now the number is up to And these are the frequency, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma stimulation. Yeah. But, you know, it's not that we make our subjects, so, so we had a lot of, of attention from the scientific community because of this paper. And it's very original and noble, we published a uh, very nice journal, and we had a lot of attention. But it's not that we make, like, super genius you know, subject. And actually, not that our subject becomes, like, super smart, okay? But still, we had a very significant modulation of time as a response. Not about the first, but response time. What was interesting is that next to this, uh, together with some colleagues uh, of, um, of Oxford, uh, Roy Cohen Kadosh, which is studying numerical processing, is maximum expert worldwide of uh, mathematical uh, skills in numerical processing and working memory. Uh, they still run together with my colleagues this kind of study, very similar one. They wanted to investigate strategy, effects of, if the effects of gamma TSS, you see 40 Hz in gamma frequency is still strong. And what did they find is that the effect is, uh, of the stimulation is, uh, is performance dependent. So, meaning that even in the previous study, in this study, as well as in this study, it correlates with the IQ of our subject. So, in, in simple words, those who perform better and they have the maximum beneficial effect of the stimulation were those who have lower IQ. Those who have higher IQ benefit less of the stimulation. Okay? And we come back to the point that brain stimulation is not that make you super smart or smarter, but it optimizes your cognitive resources. Okay? Those who have a really like high IQ, they don't benefit so much. Those who have low IQ, lower IQ, they benefit the most. Okay? This is a significant correlation. Then <coughs> There was this uh, interesting study with alternating color stimulation, which again demonstrate the, this entrainment effect into endogenous oscillatory activity. So during sleep, it was shown that uh, gamma stimulation induced this kind of lucid dream phenomenon which is a consciousness phenomenon inside the dream, okay? Now, it looks like sci-fi stuff, <laughs> but actually, you need to think about the... Um, so, 
I know this group. I was working in Gottingen for a while. <coughs> and these groups, like Ursula Voss, is an uh, expert of sleep and works together with Michael Nietzsche, but Walter Powers is one who invented, let's say, among them, the TBCS technique, not the ACS, TBCS. So it's, it's like this group, this German group, is the one that's producing most of the paper on TBCS, on motor cortex. The idea is that don't think that you just stimulate the brain and you have this lucid dream, this inception-like uh, phenomenon, okay? It's not working like this. There are, first of all, like you need to recruit subjects who are who have like a specific score in this hypnosis question. So who are susceptible to this hypnosis phenomenon. Second, you need to think about that there are lots of people, and we don't know because we don't experience this, that for them it's very common, for example, one of my closest friends and colleague, he, he suffered about this, it's called OBA, it's a, this extra body experience phenomenon. So people, you go to sleep and you start to see yourself from outside, okay? Before to fall asleep, like when you start to have this kind of uh, REM-like activity before just to... And even when you start to wake up, they have this kind of phenomenon, so they see outside of, of the body. So these kind of people, this... I know this looks strange, but it's very common. I didn't know that, so it's really common, okay? And for people that they don't inquire about this because they think the people has this kind of phenomenon. And then, usually these people are the ones also which are very susceptible to hypnosis. Like. So you select this kind of subject, has this specific score, and they show that those who receive uh, like uh, gamma frequency, 20 hertz TACS, and they reported this consciousness phenomenon inside the dream. They tested this the day after, okay? And this effect is frequency dependent. So they tested in gamma, they tested in high gamma, they tested in low beta, theta, and so on, and sha. Okay? These also have lots of attention also from the media. So how does it work this TSES? Just to be more uh, on the point, okay? You have your EEG spontaneous activity. If a specific brain region, okay, your EEG activity oscillates, let's say, uh, in alpha frequency, okay, and you deliver alpha stimulation, you might induce. So your 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 um, if the stimulation go face lock to the phase of your oscillatory activity, you might use this boost, okay? This increase of alpha power. That's why then afterwards you have this behavioral increase of performance. So this is what ESCS induce, frequency dependent effect, state dependent as we show what the image may not, and time And the effects are individual performance based. As you show, for example, by the study of intelligence, the second one, okay? So, for example, if my IQ is certain, you know, it's very high, I don't benefit so much of stimulation, if my IQ is lower, I can benefit more, likely I can benefit more of the, of the stimulation, okay? Well, so, then I start to wonder, are these TACS effects so robust, okay? And I wanted to test TACS effect with a very stable task. This is classic digit span task. Okay? So what is the digit span? If I give you like a series of numbers, there is a classic protocol like 3, 7, 8. Okay, you need to repeat 3, 7, 8. If you repeat correctly, I add another digit. Okay? Mm -hmm. 1, 7, 9, 4, and you need to repeat 1, 7, 9, 4. Correct? One digit. Okay? Until you we reach the span. There is the digit forward and the digit backward. Digit backward is much, much, is much more demanding. It, uh, it requires more executive function. Uh, for example, I give you like 7, 9, 1, 3, and you need to repeat the reverse, okay? 3, 1, 7, 9, and 3, 1, 9, 7. 
okay? In the back part of it, it's not easy. And then if you do correct, you add another region. Now, the, you know, it's the one that is, you know, this kind of short-term memory actually is, it's, it's not correct to call it like a working memory, uh, short-term memory, I prefer to call it like working memory span, okay? It's classical phenomenon that, you know, when you have to uh, enter a pin code uh, or you need to remember a phone number, the number of items you have in your basket when you go to the supermarket, for example, how many times it happens and you, you, they give you a number and you rehearse this number in your mind, you repeat inside your mind, you need, you need to you have this kind of rehearsal activity, okay? Or the phone number, in order to keep it in mind. And this is classical phenomenon. So, what it, this kind of test is a sub, you know, it's classical sub test of the device <coughs> test. Excellent intelligence skill is used in your psychological assessment. Okay, forward, I told you how does it work, or backward, it works in reverse, and so on. Now, what is interesting is that I tell you just this is if you want to read it. So what is important is that this, the span score, so your digit span is very stable. If you span day seven, in one week it's still seven. It's very difficult, it's very long this effect. And it's modulated mainly by cognitive decline, aging, like me, and, and, and scolarity, okay? And of course, cognitive disease. So aging is modulated. But if you, of course, at, at the beginning you make yourself to do a training eventually if you want to make a proper study. But really, it's very difficult to have a, if your span is eight, today is eight in one week or two weeks, still eight. Okay, it's very robust effect. And my idea was let's try to modulate. Let's see how robust are also are the effect of TACS. And try to modulate the span. So we didn't want to modulate the reaction time or speed, but just proper span. And what we did, the first we check which are are involved, okay, and which network is involved in this kind of task. And usually during the forward span, like this three, five, six, and you repeat three, five, six, okay. This is forward version. The right cortex is involved, and usually during the backward, it's a bright frontal network. But during the backward, mostly is the frontal part. Okay, the oxalate upper frontal cord is more involved in this, probably because you require more executive function and you need to do this mental rotation. So you have to do kind of double, double task. Seven, eight, nine, seven, one, two, seven, one, three, let's say, and you need to reverse it. So you have, you need to keep seven, one, three, and then two rotation, three, one, seven. Okay, think about the people that are usually your age, you have a backward span that can go like six plus one, plus minus one, like at least in average, or maybe more. Okay, it's a start, but you can do it. So then we check which is the usual endogenous oscillator activity of this network, and this uh, is in beta. So we thought the beta could be our kind of frequency, right? Frequency is oscillating in beta. Of course. So we we call the beta to be our our frequency, target frequency. But still, we want to use also other frequency to control our our. Effect. So what we did, we simulated. It's time to go to it. Mm. We simulated. <laughs> and we simulated classical neuropsychological assessment. And we deliver to the subject this digit in auditory modality. Okay? And what we did is did in this case, we did a computerized version of this task, and the digits were delivered by a digitalized voice without any accent or inflection. Because if I, even in a neuropsychological assessment, if I tell you the number like three, seven, nine with an accent. <laughs> it's likely you pay more attention and you're going to remember better. If I'm tired at the end of the day, you're seven, nine, one, you don't even pay attention, okay? 
So we wanted to have really standardized uh, simulations of a neuropsychological assessment by doing this. We target the parietal cortex, red electrodes on the left, here. We deliver randomly this frequency of stimulation with expectation on this, in this frequency, to find something here. And actually, we decided to do something interesting, because I really I wanted to test young and old people. But since uh, it's not, it was not easy in my, to find the old, old people coming uh, uh, to the hospital, it was pretty tricky. We decided to focus on middle age. Because middle age also, you know, usually when people start brain activity, there is this huge literature in between, like the people compare young and old. Okay, but cognitive decline usually is being shown that it's starting already from 35 years old, unfortunately, for me. <laughs> and, and the idea was like, let's try to pass this middle age uh, uh, range of people between 35 and 50, okay? 55, remember. And this between 18 and 35. So we divided the two groups. And what we found is that so when only for the digit forward, digit backward we didn't find so much. But during the digit forward, we increased the span performance only in the young group, not in the middle age group. Okay, this effect was frequency specific. Beta increased memory span for the young group, but not for the middle age group. And then we probably found we, we found out probably a significant correlation with this better uh, performance. So the younger the subject, the higher the performance. The old in all the two groups collapsed. So the older the subject, uh, the the less is the benefit of better stimulation. This was very interesting. So. The idea why this is happening in the article, and if you want, you can check it out. This is published on the journal Neurophysiology, and you can check it out. What is interesting is speculated that, you know, in middle age, better endogenous local activity, and especially in aging and in patients, it becomes bilateral and desynchronized. So we have a kind of change of state of the oscillatory activity. This is happening also in the frontal lobes in memory. So when we are younger, it's more left lateralized. When we are getting it, in aging, it becomes more bilateral. Probably we didn't affect with TSCS middle age performance because of this change of endogenous shellator activity. But unfortunately, we didn't check by EEG this was happening. It was just one of the interpretations of that. So the idea is that we can boost brain function, but inside certain limits. Okay? Then. Uh, we can find individual differences in terms of baseline performance, which must be taken into account. For example, this IQ, high and low, who can benefit? For example, now, in the digital span, they benefit the younger, probably because they also have more cortical, you know, more, more, let's say, effective cortical plasticity, okay? And for example, the point is also now there is a trend that if you uh, the real boost you might have by brain stimulation if you associate brain stimulation together with the training, daily training, for example. Okay, daily training plus brain stimulation in this higher enhancement effect respect to just training or just brain stimulation. Training is always the one that will just more more uh, boost. I will I think we are uh, Almost at the end, I will just go fast on this. There is also genetic, ge genetic uh, component when we're talking about the effect of brain stimulation, enhancement effect, effect of brain activity, of your behavioral performance. And you know, for example, there is this, uh, there are some uh, genes and some proteins like BDNF, in some polymorphisms like VAT66 MET polymorphisms, like COM66 polymorphisms, or some other genes like APOE, which is also market for Alzheimer, one of the markets for Alzheimer, for memory performance. And, you know, 
BDNF is a neurotropic factor. Mm -hmm. Is a, a neuro neuronal growth factor. Okay, so it helps to develop the central nervous system since you're born. Is activity dependent. So, for example, it's been shown that if you do even if you do sports, you increase the secretion of BDNF, and this and your brain can benefit from this in terms of plasticity effect. The, our idea, for example, in this, in, in, in carrying out here is that I will, I will skip this stuff. Is that so? Actually, in the brain, like looks like uh, BDNF is mainly concentrated in a deep, deeper structure, like hippocampo, the frontal side, which actually they are memory performance related. You know, hippocampus is very important for memory. Mm -hmm. um, and also, as we show that it has a polling of this, of these uh, genes, like, uh, which is called bat 66 met polymorphism, who is bat met and has this polymorphism, has, has a reduced volume of hippocampus, okay? which most of the times correlate with lower memory performance. So, the idea is that, you see, in the nerve is related to plasticity, in the matrix structure, and memory learning. Who has this polymorphism, which usually is 10 to 20 percentage of the population, has reduced plasticity, has reduced volume of the campus and prefrontal cortex, and poor memory, poorer memory performance. Look, this is not a disease, okay? I might be, but I don't know. So I can just check my blog. Actually, I know. But the point is that the point is that now we decided to start and to focus on this. But it's also true. I was talking not so long time ago, uh, and also listening to this being this very nice lecture by Yula Kovas, which she said, okay, so you have a market, but you need to have three, four markets in order to see if this can really affect. For example, now there is this trend of study which show that who's well met has a poorer memory performance, which well has higher memory performance. But there are some other studies that they show that they have the same memory performance. What is changing is the strategy. For example, so maybe well met use different strategy or different networking in terms of brain activity. So what we did, for example, we ran a TMS study here on two groups well and well met. We targeted Salata the frontal cortex with EMS to check changing in memory performance among the two groups. Okay, Valvan and Valnet. So who has this polymer things, who has not this polymer things. Okay, we use some words. In encoding people saw some words. They had to do different tasks. One task was to tell if the words is living or living, semantic, meaning like deep processing. And one task was to find the letter O or not O inside the word. More superficial encoding. It's called shallow encoding. No? If you focus on the letter inside the, the word, you don't read the word, you don't, you don't process the word semantically. It's called shallow encoding. And afterwards, okay, we ask the subject just to do an old new task. Did you see this word before? Yes or no? There were old words and new words. And we tag with TMS this to brain art. And what we show is that, for example, you can see that in our study, and we have lots of subjects, performance, you see, this is the TMS side. No TMS, baseline, okay? Normal situation during the task. Left with the prefrontal cortex, right with the prefrontal cortex, stimulation, vertex, control side. You can see that performance of BALMED, in recognizing all item, and in memory performance, is around, for, for example, for this item, is around 75 percentage. So it's not significantly lower the percentage of the valve. Okay? What is interesting is that since <coughs> there is this plasticity related relationship between uh, uh, the BDNF factor and the memory function, so meaning that this valve looks like has more plasticity. Since brain stimulation, or as well as TMS, or can be TDCS, is linked to this LTP-like phenomenon, long-term potentiation phenomenon, looks like valve, they are more susceptible 
to bring interference because they are more let's say the system is more flexible there is more plasticity of that and in fact if we target the lateral sort of contact cortex which is involved in, sem in semantic uh, retrieval we found a drop of performance of memory only in the verbal but not in the verbal okay this data is important okay it's not super raw it, does, it doesn't change the, the effect is there it's not so robust but still is there okay but in terms of performance the two groups they don't differ so much at least in our study and not so other evidence so this is normalized data so the point is this many factors may affect brain stimulation effect Okay, for example, uh, aging, uh, uh, baseline performance, as we saw from IQ, uh, genetic uh, factors can affect brain stimulation effect, and also pay attention because what does it mean? This it means that if you want to use, you see, there are seven this kind of device to make home brain stimulation boost your performance. Okay, don't do this. <laughs> Because it doesn't make any sense. If you put these electrodes on the frontal cortex and you're doing the motor task and you think you're doing better, it doesn't make any sense. You need to understand which is your baseline performance, which is your brain activity you can measure, and which is your brain region involved in that task. Then, after that, you can think about to stimulate the specific side of the brain. Did you see how we do? We do neural navigation, we go precise on the side, check and effect. This is just stuff you put on your on your on your brain and you give electricity. <laughs> it's not uh, I don't see any beneficial effect, honestly. Okay? Can we use this as a placebo? Yeah. <laughs> and then I was, I was saying before, like uh, if you want to boost your brain function, like forget about becoming a superhero. Okay, it doesn't work like that. Okay, so we can use changes, we can boost performance, but it, what I'm thinking is that we optimize the system. Okay, it's not that we make we make the system let's say you know we, we, we boost the system we, we boost the system because we optimize our resources brain resources okay i think that's it this is the people who were working on me on this study i presented and this is my group now my motor control group yeah okay thank you <laughs> uh, thank you very much do you have any questions about uh, okay, I have a small question. Uh, the main uh, studies you focused on to see us were, were about the procedure when one lettuce was placed in the head and another was placed somewhere else, but not mm. in the head. But I have also seen the articles when there were two electrodes, Katogu and Anodo, both on the head. And that's I would good. like to ask what's the point of this methodology and... Uh, and it, yeah, it's a very good question. Actually, I use both this is the head, or well, it's not the best, this is the head. Let's say this is the head, okay? and inside there is the brain. Okay? Speed distortion. So, and this is the, the guy. Now, the point is, it's a very good question. The point is that there are two, there were two main schools. Okay? And, for example, one is a back to the early school, all the series of study which they use usually for example one electrode on the cortex and one electrode on the shoulder or on the arm okay why they do this because for example with tdcs the electrical current of the anode of course wants to reach the cathode mm -hmm. so meaning that the current has a tendency to go towards the other electrodes so the idea is if you push, uh, for example, motor cortex here or prefrontal cortex, then you put an electrode here, like a reference. The idea is that who use monopolar, this is called monopolar montage, one electrode, this is bipolar montage. Who use bipolar, the, the, the monopolar supporters, they say that the electric current flow among these two electrodes mostly mm -hmm. and doesn't go inside. 
too much. Mm. Because they are attracted from each other and instead to go inside the electrical current, it goes to the it goes to the other electrons. And then in this instead guys, uh, supporter of the bipolar, they say that mostly the same story. They say if you put the electrodes here, meaning it's more far, it's likely that the current won't reach the shoulder, doesn't that just flow through your skin and doesn't pass, doesn't go inside the skull. Mm -hmm. I was mostly used this voltage, bipolar, mm -hmm. then I changed to monopolar and I see in my study a bit more clear effect. Mm -hmm. But I think that it also this can be effective. It changed the distribution in the skull and it changed also the distribution of the cortical area you are stimulating. For example, if you, now there are lots of modeling which they show that if you use uh, one electrode here one, and the reference you put one here and one here, mm -hmm. you stimulate more desire. If you put this electrode here, you stimulate more desire. There is a lots of modeling on this. Now we are, we are more happy. So we can use this modeling, modeling if you understand. But that's the answer. So the point is that we use this montage, we want to be sure that all the currents go inside. Mm -hmm. But maybe the spread, since the electrical current wants to go here, you stimulate more wider area. Mm -hmm. If you do like this, you limit this widening and you make more focus here. But these guys complain that the currents go through this two and not in one side. Mm -hmm. It's very open question. Okay. But there are, no, there are a few modeling studies that they show. Monopolar, okay. dipolar, uh, ring light, also target here and reference function before, it's called HD montage, mm -hmm. high definition montage. So you contain the spread of the current from the target by making reference here. So. And then you have the, this is the other situation. You define, you limit, you force the current to stay there, so you more focus. There are studies of things. I can send you some questions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. And then mm -hmm. I have a question. Uh, you said uh, that there are a lot of factors uh, which influence uh, how it will work. And uh, on the other hand, uh, they are usually quite small samples. So do you have problems with uh, the introduction of the results? And are there any publication, publication bias uh, in this study? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, how we work or work? Yeah, I mean, uh, you have a small sample. You obtain some results. Small sample of what? Subject? Of, of subject, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, do you think that there is a publication bias uh, that people obtain some results uh, and publish an article, but uh, then uh, they cannot uh, take um, education the same results and do not publish? I think there are some publication bias. It depends by study, it depends study by study. For example, if you use, a, if you use like a strong technique, um, for example, if you administer, if you administer uh, in some subject, like you want to study particular cellular clinic or the motor cortex, you administer some, let's say, an MDI receptor antagonist, okay? Like uh, that's that, that's the name of what, kind of medical drugs, okay? So you actually, even with eight subjects, you can really check, you can really see that you block mm -hmm. this kind of phenomenon, an MDI phenomenon. Okay? And then you can see with do the DCS that you don't have any effect on the subject. So what I mean is it depends first by the technique you use. If you just do behavioral study, you need to test a lot of subjects. If you have a strong technique like medical drug, mm -hmm. like functional magnetic arrangements, you can reduce the number of subjects because you increase the power, the statistical power by the technique. Then another important point is to use a power analysis. If you have an experiment which you have lots of condition, usually if you do power analysis, you need, you need to understand how many subjects do you need to have a realistic, uh, uh, you know, statistically valuable data. And then it depends also by the statistic analysis that you run. If it's conservative enough, if it's representative of the population, so people use ANOVA and, and so on. Mm -hmm. This depends. But I would suggest to use a power analysis. And I would suggest, for example, to have an experiment not with so many conditions, for example, inside. This can be revised or that. Yes, it's a very good point, but 
It depends by the technique also that you use. There are some TDCS studies, they tested, they published with eight subjects, maybe. And then they also replicate the results. So it's a replic you can reproduce the results. Maybe because they just use a cathode and a sham, and then you, on the motor cortex, they check just one parameter. And then you, you see the effect is consistent with other this subject. They have just few conditions. Um, but I will use also power uh, analysis to predict how many subjects you need in specific condition. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, uh, any other questions you'd like to ask? Okay, uh, Matteo, thank you very much for the presentation. It was very useful, I guess, for all of us. Very interesting. Yeah,